This is parachuting into Solomon's world where he reflects about his dad, David, the greatest king Israel ever had. And Solomon says, it says, while the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, the king Solomon turned around and blessed them. Then he said, praise be to the Lord God of Israel, who with his own hand has fulfilled what he promised with his own mouth to my father David. For he said, since the day I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city or a tribe of Israel to build me a temple, but I have chosen David to rule my people Israel. My father David had it in his heart to build me a temple for the name of the Lord. But the Lord said to my father David, because it was in your heart, not that phrase, because it was in your heart to build me a temple, you did well to have this in your heart. Nevertheless, you are not the one to build it, but your son will. On the March the 3rd, 1968, Martin Luther King, a month before he was assassinated, preached from this very passage at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, where three generations of his family prior to him had worshipped there. His granddad and dad had pastored there. And he took this very passage you're reading from tonight and took this thought. And the thought he took from it was that, that God, God loves it when we have things in, heart, in our hearts to do for him that we know we will never see finished. This is why it was important to God to commend David because David had made finances available. David had made arrangements as best he could for a project called the temple that he knew he would never live to worship in, but he lived as if he would. He made as much provision for it as if he would benefit from it like anyone else. And it was important for Solomon to record that God said, David, you had this in your heart and it was good. High five. You had this in your heart. Now, what's the point of that? having it in your heart if you want the one that's going to get the credit for building it because God loves it. When every generation, especially of the church, this should be society, but certainly the church, when we, when we have things in our hearts that we want to do for God that we know we will never see completed in our generation, but we commit to it, we sacrifice for it, we work towards it anyway. Society, humanity thrives when men plant trees under whose shade they know they will never sit. But this is not common in society. It is not common, certainly, in the church. And I'm calling this message the cathedral in your heart. The cathedral in your heart. Because I'm using the word cathedral as a metaphor. Because on average, I discovered, it took two to 500 years to build a cathedral. The ancient cathedrals of Europe took hundreds of years to build. And therefore, the people that worked on the cathedral on any given generation more than likely would not be the ones, most of them would never be the ones to worship in that cathedral. Neither would their kids or the kids' kids ever see it completed. And yet, every generation that worked on the cathedral worked on it as if a generation to come would enjoy what they never could and it didn't diminish their commitment it didn't weaken their work ethic. It didn't compromise their financial attachment to it. Even though they knew they would not live to see it fulfilled. And I know how hard it is as a pastor to keep people interested financially in a project that takes a year. <laughs> pastor Phil got up here and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to start a building program. I want us all to get involved financially. It's going to take 150 years. Hope you're all on board. <laughs> He'd be like, are you kidding me? And, and this cathedral in our hearts is, is, is my way of saying we have to have something in our hearts that, that we are living for that's beyond ourselves, that's bigger than us, that's beyond our generation. And I say this because I have been a Christian for 42 years. When I got saved as a teenager, I came from a non-church going background, my family uh, we're not church goers, and I got saved at school through the witness of a school teacher when I was 15 years of age. And I remember going into a local Pentecostal church and being raised in Pentecostal charismatic churches. And what I realized early on, lots of things, one of which was that we were, we were what I would call an, um, an end-time generation mentality. 
We believe that Jesus would return in our lifetime. This is what I was raised to believe, and this is what preachers preached, and we had songs with lyrics in them about that. Some would specialize in explaining that to us with charts on the wall, and the charts would go around the wall, and when the charts ran out, we had to get bigger buildings to put more charts up, and the charts would track the book of Revelation and explain to us, and, and I was raised on this. Some of, some of you were too. Some of you Young people in here don't know what I'm talking about. That's good. That's okay. I'll come to you in a moment. But I'm, I'm saying upstream. I'm trying to flag up a cause and effect. And I was raised on this final generation, Jesus is coming in our lifetime, culture, theology, mindset. Looking back, it didn't produce anything good in us. It was supposed to, but it didn't. Because what it produced was an odd relationship with unsafe people. We saw them as people to be evangelized only. Because we may be going to heaven tomorrow, so we'll snatch you, as it were, to take with us. So we kind of did evangelistic assaults on people. <laughs> we should have had awards for surviving evangelism from us. Because there was this sense of immediacy. There was this sense of Jesus is coming tonight or tomorrow. So we didn't build relationships with people. We didn't build friendships with unchurched people. We had no involvement socially in our communities because why would we invest in social issues that would take decades maybe to make a dent on if we might not be here tomorrow? It was why we didn't do that. So what it produced in us was a detachment and what it produced in us was an uncoupling from a sense of responsibility to make a difference in our world because we believed that Jesus would be coming any moment. We had this temporary, passing through, immediate, kind of live for now mentality. And we were detached from problems and we had no long-term thinking, no long-term conversations, no long-term investments. We were aloof from the world. I can even remember... We didn't, we didn't insure our stuff. Because to insure your stuff meant you had stuff worth insuring, which meant you were over-attached to the world. And to insure your stuff meant that you had given too much of your wealth to material things, which meant you were over-attached to a world we may be leaving tomorrow. So we didn't insure our stuff. So none of us had nice stuff. Or if we had nice stuff, we didn't wear it to church or drive it to church. We left it at home. So we blended in. We didn't have pensions because to have a pension plan, a retirement plan, was, was to not believe that Christ was coming in your lifetime. So to have a financial plan for your later life was an act of unbelief, I suppose. And so when I look back at these things, I can remember people saying to me, if you're in the cinema when Jesus comes, then he might leave you there. Or if you are doing whatever and we had this list of stuff that was all the things we shouldn't be doing on Sunday or on the Sabbath or, you know, we shouldn't be watching TV or a soap opera or we shouldn't be buying ice cream on Sunday or going to the shops or we shouldn't be in the discotheque, as it used to be called. <laughs> I know. I remember growing up and so what it did was it, it bred this fear in us uh, because we didn't want to be in the wrong place doing the wrong thing if Jesus came. And as I look back, what it produced in us was the worst thing ever it could have produced in the church. It produced stationary Christianity. It produced people that were parked up because of a theology that produced that in us whilst we shouted to the unchurched to get saved, to repent, to turn or burn with some of the versions of that brutal approach to people, all of this sprang from our belief that there would be no next generation. So the young people in our churches, we didn't see that they were someone to leave a legacy to, someone through whom we would continue what we'd started. We didn't see them as that. We didn't teach them and train them that way. We said to them, Jesus is coming, and they, like me from 15, grew up through my teenage years, believing that Jesus would come anytime. And as I look back, this was so unhelpful to the early days of my Christianity. Now, fast forward, 30, fast forward 30 plus years. I have tracked this sucker. Mm. It's still in the church. 
it still is here in a form and a fashion that troubles me a little bit. It's had a wash and a brush up. It has a more respectable, exciting name than, you know, Jesus is coming in our lifetime. And I'm talking about this word revival or end time outpouring or end time move of God or whatever language we all hear for that and about it. I am concerned that this belief system still does not produce anything good in us. Because if we believe that in our lifetime there's going to come some great end time move of God, it's almost like we can relax a little bit. We don't need to be too generationally minded because anyway, Jesus is going to come in our lifetime. It's, it's, a, it's a rehashed version of what I grew up with. And it may sound more exciting and more thrilling to call it these names, but I just wonder whether or not it's producing inertia in the church around the world. To me, it's like some people's expression of that, some people's response to that theology is that it's like spending what you don't have because you're convinced you're going to win the lottery. So we, we live in a way that it doesn't matter that right now I'm not reaching anybody, right now I'm not thinking generationally, right now I'm not investing in our community, right now we're not involved in social improvement, in the infrastructure of our communities. It doesn't matter because one day revival is going to come and what revival will do is square it all the way. There's going to be an unprecedented move of God. Millions and millions of unchurched people are going to flood into our buildings. Our buildings are what we're big enough. I've heard it all before. And we're going to have this tsunami. There's a word that will get you going. This tsunami of a visitation of the Holy Spirit to which I say, says who? Because at best, the theology for this is thin. At worst, it's a fantasy. And I wish, I wish this theology was much more to hand and much more obvious and it wasn't obscure and it didn't take experts to dig it out like the charts on the wall used to be. And the rest of we that were uninitiated in theological things would just receive it as that's what we're supposed to believe. But I want you to track with me, and especially all you young people in here. That's why I mentioned that lift full, die empty. Because, because I think we have to come back to this reality. That when people have said to me over the years, what do you believe the greatest strategy is? Because our church has grown unusually for Europe and for England. And so people are interested in that. And ask questions like, so why is your church, what's the best strategy? What's the best church growth idea you've ever had. And I know they expect me to say three or four things that they can go and franchise, but the best church growth strategy that, that the world, that the church has ever seen is what I'm looking at now. It's you. All the growth of this church is here. Whatever God's going to do in this city in the next 20 years, is not, I repeat, not in heaven. It's already here in your hearts. There's nothing. Th th there's. So, so if we accept that premise, that, that the next move of God is already here. It's inside you. If we accept that, then for that to happen... It isn't so much that we need an outpouring of God as an outpouring of you. If we believe this, if we, and this is difficult because the big R, the big R is not revival. The big R is maybe responsibility, which is far less popular and harder to speak about. I wonder if that big R now for us and for you young people should mean something else because what it did mean didn't help me and didn't help my generation in the room. And we parked up for years praying for God to move. And I believe it became like a Mexican standoff between God and the church. Like a, like a chess game where the church is at one side of the board and God's at the other. And the church is looking to God saying, it's your move, Lord. Move, Lord. Move, Lord. Move, Lord. And I think God's at his side of the board going, 
not my move. It's not my move. What do you mean, Lord, it's not your move? Move, Lord. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not my move. I think God might say to us, if he bothers to explain that to us, I moved 2,000 years ago. And I think he'd say to us, what did you do with that? And I think he'd also say to us, the way some of you pray to me, the way some of you get all carried away and all fired up and shabba dabba do at me, and I'm a shabba dabba do, I just think we exaggerate the whole point of it and use it like a rabbit's foot lucky charm. I think God would say to us, the way you pray to me and shout at me and call them from the north, south, east, and west, and nobody's coming, but you call them anyway. I think the way you shout at me, God, would, God might say to the church, what do you think I've got up here that's better than Jesus? I think he might say to us, do you think, do you think I'm holding out on you? Do you think I've got a second son hiding behind the throne? That I forgot to tell you about? Do you think that if you are hardcore Navy SEAL enough in your Christianity, if you pray more and fast more than those other lazy beggars before you, that you may be the ones that will wrestle from a reluctant God this end time thing that we call something that we don't know where we got those language from, but we call it something as if God's going to, okay, you were the ones that were more sincere than the rest, so I'm going to do it for you. I think, I think what, what a lot of this striving and a lot of this stressful Christianity comes from is this belief system that we're going to be the ones that will wrestle it from God. But I've got to tell you something. Churches that for 25 years have been doing this and they're not growing and they're losing relevance and turning inward are getting open to a new idea. And the new idea is more along the lines of maybe God is looking to us more than we should be looking to him. Maybe God has gone to the church, tag, you're it. And he went, tag, you're it. The moment you got saved, he went, tag, you're it. Then we stood there for 10 years. Oh, move, Lord. Lord, <laughs> Lord, use me, Lord. Use me. Send me. Hello. Tag, you're it. What part of your it <laughs> aren't you getting? Well, Lord, use me by your spirit. And we get all this stuff. And God's like, hello. Another five years went by while you are parked up. And what I've realized and what you must realize is that Throughout history, wherever there has been what we would call a move of God, the only way you know there was a move of God is because of a person's name. Was there a move of God in Nehemiah's time? Yes. How do we know? Nehemiah. And if I were God, I honestly, I'd have a better idea than using people because we are so flaky. We are so unreliable. Why would God condescend and why would God limit himself to a species as unreliable as us? But he does because when Genesis 8 says that God found Noah, are you kidding me? Why, why would an omnipotent, an omnipotent, omniscient God need to find anyone? Just send an angel. If I were God, I'd send an angel. Just send a bunch of angels who do as they're told and get it done. But God has confined himself. He has, let's call it what it is. He has shrunk himself down. He has constrained himself. He has limited himself to the caliber of the people on any given watch of the church generationally. That according to the quality of us, according to how much we pour us out, determines what happens in that season of church history. Not according to how much he pours out, because God's the same generation in generation out but we are not it would help if our bible had blank pages because it goes straight from Noah to Abraham but that's not what happened there's hundreds of years between Noah and Abraham and it would help if you turned a page into testamental period 400 years it would help if it had blank pages and on each page you said God's not doing anything can't find anybody. God's not doing anything. Can't find anybody. God's not doing anything. Can't find anybody. And on that would go for generations because seriously, that's the deal. That God only moves. God only 
pours out, as we call it. There's only a spike in history that we historically call what a move of God. Central to it was somebody, a group of people, a person that, that, that like Nehemiah, that when he hears about Jerusalem, he's in tears. Others heard about Jerusalem that weren't in tears. So he's in tears. So something's happening inside him that is not common. And that internal movement in him became an outpouring of Nehemiah's heart who risked his life to do what he did. And it says Sambalat and Tobiah were resistant and enemies, but it says there in, in Nehemiah that they were disturbed. Not that the church were praying for God to move. Not that they were disturbed. There's a revival coming. It says they were disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the people. History is only disturbed when someone comes to promote the welfare of the people. Not when it is our virtual reality desire or prayer. You know, over the years, three plus decades in the same church and pastoring and helping people grow, you all know this. These moves of God around the earth, you know, Toronto, Argentina, Pensacola, you know, in my lifetime, and there'll be others that will, that will you know, get on the radar of the church around the world. But I used to get fed up when the church people said to me, have you been to the move of God? And I'd say, no, are you going? I don't think so. Um, and it's not that I don't believe we can learn from what God's doing somewhere else. Here's what I kind of resented. The implication is that the move of God is always where you're not. <laughs> What's up with that? Why do I always have to get on the plane and go to the move of God? And I say to our church, there is no such thing as the move of God anyway. God's doing millions of things simultaneously in the earth, most of which you'll never hear a thing about. So there's no the move of God. But I'm after, I'm after the church understanding this, and you guys and the young people here, and I know you get this, I know you understand this stuff, because I know your leadership, but it helps to under, underline this at the start of 2016. So we don't get to July and we're saying move God, and it's like, I'm going to miss your move. That, that God would say to us that the clock's ticking and, uh, and you're getting no younger and the move of God isn't on a plane somewhere around the world. And if I said to you tonight, is Joyce Meyer or Reinhard Bonnke or Joel Olstein or these known things in the world, if I said to you, are they a move of God, you would say to me? Okay, it's not a trick question. <laughs> of course they're moves of God. But what I'm after is to say to you, is this? Is this in this room tonight? Is this church? Is this a move of God? Because this is what we got to get down to. That the move of God isn't what happens two or three times in a lifetime. And we go and we visit it and we get blessed and we get touched. And then we come back to, to boring business as usual, beige, kind of oh, local church stuff. I must said years ago at the Hillsong Conference, I remember saying years ago, you know, most Christians have two gods. They have a conference God and a local church God. <laughs> and they think those gods don't know each other. <laughs> the, the, the conference God is like Father Christmas. Because <laughs> the conference God treats me in a way that the local church God, that's like a father, doesn't treat me. The conference God just zaps me in the prayer line and I get called out by a random preacher who doesn't know me from Adam who, who says these things over me that I'm going to be the next Billy Graham and, and then I fall in the prayer line and, and then I go back to my local church and um, take that big blank check to my boring pastor and say, I'm, you know, I went to this conference and I, this guy didn't know me. It had to be the Holy Spirit. He called me out and said to me, thou art the next Billy Graham. And uh, what are you going to do about it, Pastor? Because I'm ready. I'm stepping up. Make way. That's the, that's the Father Christmas, you know, the, the visiting preacher that didn't know you from Adam. Has a one-night stand. <laughs> ain't going ain't to parent you. Ain't going to raise you. Ain't going to have any, anything to do with what he told you. And then you go to the local church guy and say, you know, next Billy Graham, you know, thank you. When are you ready? And the local church pastor says, well, you know what? One day you may be the next Billy Graham. One day you may touch the world and millions of people come to Christ. But right now, 
You're an idiot. <laughs> and you're a, you're a lovable one, and we love you, but right now, it would be a great idea if you got a J-O-B. <laughs> and if you can maybe get on with people a bit more, that would be good. And if you can stop spending what you don't have, and if you can stop being non-team player and stop being moody, you know, let's work on that stuff in 2016 and maybe 2017. <laughs> maybe 2017 we can get a bit near to Billy. <laughs> it's like my grandkids that ask their parents for a biscuit, a cookie, and they say no, so they ask me, not telling me that they'd asked their parents, and I give them, you know, sweet things, because I, I don't care, they're not sleeping at my house. <laughs> Sugar them up. I think we treat the church and the conference God like that. And what I'm after saying to you tonight is that this, this is the greatest move of God, the local church, that the world will ever get close to, because we're here long after that stuff's come and gone. And thank God for everything he does, but we are a generational answer. The local church is a generational initiative on behalf of God into the earth, and there's nothing to replace it. And I'm looking at the greatest move of God the world will ever see. I'm looking at you. You should look in the mirror every morning. And after you've said, the joy of the Lord is my strength, <laughs> say, I am a walking move of God. Ah, I am. There's no cavalry. There's no plan B. Tag your it. I've got to pour me out today. It's an outpouring of me that we've got to have in 2016. I've got to get out my potential. I've got to get my gift and my love and my grace and compassion. I've got to empty me out. I want to, I want to be full today. I'm glad I was in church, but I've got to hit the ground running tomorrow morning and pour out something that I know and I've understood and I've learned. I've got to live full and die empty because the world is waiting for a revelation of us, for the outpouring of the church. And I talk to leaders and pastors and listen to all kinds of stuff around the world, and I get so tired of this. It's okay for you. You live in England. It's okay for you in Australia, and big churches are common, and it's normal where you are, and we live in this place and that place, and the devil and the principalities and the powers, and we have resistance, and we have things in our... You know, we should say to some churches and to some Christians... Come out of that demon and leave it alone. <laughs> huh? Because it's not so much a case of the church is possessed by the devil as the devil's possessed by the church. I think the devil must go to God sometimes. Hey, it was not me. <laughs> they did that all by themselves. And I think, devil must, I think God must look at the devil and say, yeah, I know. I wasn't you. I'm not being blaming you. They're doing a great job. They don't need you. You are redundant in that church. <laughs> but the devil doesn't mind the publicity. He likes to think he's responsible for all of that. We should get Christians to come forward while we deliver them from the demon that they're possessing. Then the demon will be like, can you get this Christian off my back? <laughs> This Christian won't leave me alone. <laughs> Let's get the band back up here. It gives people, gives people hope we finish when you say that. <laughs> you know what? All you under 30s in here, you, you are our future. You are this community's or wherever you're from's future. And I don't want us to be continuing this faulty belief system that I think I grew up with where we lead you to believe that really you can tread water, you can mark time, or you can have a great church experience, you can have a lovely time, be blessed and filled, and occasionally invite a friend to come to an event at Christmas. It's not enough. That we have to salt and light, we have to involve and reach out and love and include and, and get out what's in you and pour you out because you are an amazing piece of kit. You are. You were born, all of you were born a flipping genius. But birth is the last day of freedom you'll ever have. It's the last day God had you to himself. 
then he trusts you to parents or guardians and society and influential figures and voices in our lives and experiences that begin to dumb down that genius and begin to rearrange that potential and be, tell you that it's not your turn yet and you're not ready yet and whilst we are believing that one day our time will come 10 years go by this is your time and your turn now tag you are it if you will run into 2016 if we will run into 2016 with that I'm it you know when Peter said this is that news flash this is still that. There's been no new this. So there's no new that. There's been no upgrade, no improvement on it. This is still that. So let's stop looking for something new. We, 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 we want a new, we want a new that. And God says, you, you haven't even begun to put a dent on the first that. This is it. You're it. And you that are saying to yourself tonight, it doesn't mean me. I don't think it means me. I especially mean you. I especially mean you. We've got to pour you out this year. You've got to get you poured out this year. 